So, with the news of the death of the former Archbishop of South Africa, or Cape Town in South Africa, so that's Archbishop Desmond Tutu, social justice, Christian, God-fearing man. It, we're going to be looking at some of his legacy and talking about my first... I remember uh, he must have been, for me, one of the first clergy people that I actually remember. And I remember his name uh, from such a young age and watching the news... Uh, on at 5 p.m. when it used to be on, and yes, we're going to be talking about Archbishop Desmond Tutu on today's episode. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode. We really appreciate you joining us. This podcast really shows us how we can all learn, live, and thrive off of each other. By sharing our knowledge through our conversations, we will impart some knowledge whilst learning ourselves how to progress even further. Here is your host. Hello, and before we start this episode, I want to share with you our new music for our Series 5. And I'm going to play you it now. Um, I hope you enjoy because we're going to be ending this episode with it as well. So here. nice and it's called our world as well so that's even better so we are talking about desmond tutu south africa's noble priest prize winning icon an uncompromising for of apartheid and a modern day activist for racial justice and lgbt rights who died on sunday at the age of 90 he was also South Africa's primate in terms of his church. He was an archbishop of the church. So where you are seeing obituaries, and we have posted one four days ago, uh, saying this and calling him a... Nobel Prize priest winning icon, I would say to Archbishop Tutu, so to him, this recognition that he got for these great acts that he did and the racial justice that he has fought at the time of when he was consecrated and made Archbishop of, even Bishop of Lesotho, when he was consecrated a bishop, even when he was made a dean of Johannesburg, I believe, he was the first African black priest to be appointed to these positions. He was the first African black priest appointed to be an Archbishop of Cape Town. A role that he served uh, for 10 years. 
from 1986 to 1996 just happens to be the first nine years of my life because I was born in 1987 and like I said in the opening I remember him on the news and TV everyone said Archbishop Tutu Archbishop Tutu now when you're a child a three-year-old child and you hear Tutu do you know what I mean or a four-year-old child a young child and you hear the words Tutu it sticks in your brain and I'm not making fun of the man's name but his name has always stuck there and Desmond Tutu in older life because it stuck there, I did Google him and I just did start to read some of his writings and I start to read about the man. And I would say that the man is a great man driven by God, driven by his following of the teachings of Jesus Christ, following and fighting tirelessly for to tear down apartheid in South Africa. What was a brutal decades long regime of apartheid against uh, the black majority. And we must remember this ended in 1994. Archbishop Tutu was made Archbishop of Cape Town and primate of the South African church in 1986. And this ended in 1996. He was known as a blunt spoken clergyman. He used his pulpit as the first black bishop of Johannesburg and later as an Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, as well as a frequent public demonstrations to galvanize public opinion against radical equality. Both at home in South Africa and globally around the world. He was nicknamed the Arch and the and Archbishop Tutu became a towering figure in his nation's history. Comparable to his to fellow noble aureate Nelson Mandela, a prisoner during white rule. Who became South Africa's first black president. So these two great men were friends. And today I was watching a video of uh, getting ready for this podcast for of Arch Tutu's life, Archbishop Tutu's life. And the government of South Africa tried to or made a little faux pas and didn't invite Desmond Tutu to Nelson Mandela's state funeral because of Nelson Archbishop Tutu in later life became outspoken against the government. That happens too. Um, <laughs> bishops, in my experience, or short experience, do like to uh, join a group to draw the inadequacies of life to the world and so they should because they are the lead the leaders of their little church communities or their families and they're like our shepherds like jesus christ is and yes it was his job to draw out the apartheid but the apartheid government and rule but what we have here is the first black secular organ or non-secular organization uh so government minister president and the first black african archbishop primate head shepherd you know one leading the religious community one leading the non-secular community but both men were friends and I couldn't get over that you know no one like didn't notice the faux pas 
to me, Archbishop Tutu would have been the first person you invite, you know, out of all of the dignitaries. Because they shared something in common. They were the first of their ethnicity to hold these high offices in the secular and religious world. Where one world is connected with each other. I thought that was just uh, a little uh, wrong. However, upon becoming president in 1994, uh, Mandela appointed Archbishop Tutu to be chairman of the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which uncovered the abuses of apartheid. Tutu's death on Sunday is another chapter of bereavement in South Africa's farewell to a generation of outstanding South Africans who have banqueted as us a liberated South Africa. Well, sorry, bequeathed. Banqueted? I think I'm thinking about my lunch now. But anyway, bequeathed us a liberated South Africa, uh, said Prisoner, President Cyril. Ramba Shosa from the pavements of resistance in South Africa to the pulpits of the world's great cathedrals and the places of worship and the prestigious setting of a noble priest prize ceremony the arch distinguished himself as a non-sectarian inclusive champion of universal human rights said the president of South Africa. He was also mentioned by the UN chief, of course Desmond Tutu, an inspiration to generations. He really is, so is Nelson Mandela. If these two men weren't strengthened in their beliefs, so for, now, for Desmond Tutu, his belief in God, his belief in the teachings and the Gospels of Jesus Christ. His belief that no man is actually evil. We must remember as Archbishop of Cape Town, and the first black Archbishop of Cape Town, in a time of apartheid, there would have been places where Archbishop Tutu would have had to go to in his job where they would have never allowed a black man to enter. There would have been communities who had to somehow put aside their differences Because their archbishop, their primate, was a black man. The first. There were... It would have been a trying time. I'm not saying there were abuses, but... There probably were, you know, and we're not going to talk about that. But to face this pressure, to not relent, to put yourself on the line for your beliefs, what true, worthy, cause is the but it all goes back to he was serving Jesus Christ he wanted and knew the truth that no man is evil, is born evil. 
So when he was dealing with these, or the apartheid government, I would say he was still praying for them. <laughs> he was still, he would treat them with humility, humility and with respect bit more respect than what he probably got from them because this was the kind of person he is or was he, he went the middle road yes he called out but he was also going to be talking to these people he had to deal with them in his job and sometimes you have to galvanize the public support to be able to go and talk to these people to say, well, wait a minute, the public are all agree with what I'm telling you. You need to listen. It's just sometimes the person you're saying this to doesn't want to listen. What's quite bad uh, to myself anyway. But... I would say he's also known for his great silly jokes, or pretty silly jokes, um, and comical humour. To me, that's many priests that I know are quite humorous and have silly jokes. Um, but a silly joke is a good way of... Um, an icebreaker, especially if someone is nervous to meet you, or if you're nervous to meet them. You know, it is a, yes, a uh, great icebreaker to, you know, just get rid of some of the calm or some of the hostility that, or the nervousness that could be there. And... Yes. Isn't it funny though that it was apartheid and that time of when in 1953 when apartheid and the government were trying to turn South Africa into a white minority ruled country. But that's when Desmond Tutu first found his calling to be a priest, to serve God in his church, to join the clergy. He, before this, was a teacher with his wife. He then decided to uh, go for ordination in 1953 when the white majority or minority national party governed ruled uh, introduced the Bantu Education Act to further their apartheid system of racial segregation and white domination disliking the act Tutu and his wife left the teaching profession with Huddleston's support Tutu chose to become an Anglican priest, and in 1956, his request to join the Ordinance Guild was turned down to his bad debts, and Harry Optonmeyer uh, paid off his debts, basically, and Tutu was a minister to St. Peter's Theological College in uh, Rosetonville, Johannesburg, which is run by the Anglican Communion Community of the Resurrection. A college which was residential and Tutu lived there while his wife moved to train as a nurse and his children lived in his parents with his parents in Munzenville and in August 1960 his wife gave birth to another daughter Naomi so So when he was at the Anglican College, he would have been taught uh, 
and studied the Bible, Anglican doctrine, I know that, Christian history and Christian ethics. He earned a literate of theology degree and a winning an Archbishop's annual ESA prize. The college's principal, Godfrey, that's a great name, uh, Paulson, wrote that Tutu has exceptional knowledge of and intelligence and is very instructive. Okay. At the same time, he showed no arrogance, mixes in well and is popular. He has obvious gifts of leadership. During his years at the college, there had been an infestation in anti-apartheid activism as well as a crackdown against it including the Sharpville massacre of 1960. Tutu and his other trainees did not engage in anti-apartheid activism. He later noted that we were in some ways a very apolitical bunch. And I wanted to read that bit. Because there are no politics and there should be no politics within the church. To me, yeah, we have things like electoral rolls and, you know, PCCs. But when secular politics and politics may, uh, uh, come into the church, and this is what I've got from Archbishop Tutu, is that, yes... It is right to draw attention to inadequacies in life. Yes, it is right to draw in, you know, to draw attention if the government are running a tangent. But it's not right to draw in party politics. It's for you to take one side and them to take the other, because at the end of the day, you are serving them, and you have to talk to these people. So staying apolitical is much better than becoming political. Ethically, efficacy, ethically, ethically, sorry. And uh, yeah, just because these conversations that you have with people, you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know who and what you're talking to or who you're going to help. You're called to help these people. And I can see what he was saying there. To stay apolitical. To stay away from it. But you can still have those feelings. It's much better than joining one side. And yes, I, I get what he's saying. So after that, um, he did some teaching in South Africa and Lesotho again. Uh he came to the UK at some point. Um, he was made Dean of St. Mary's Cathedral, Johannesburg, and Bishop of Lesotho um, in 1975. And then General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. So, yes, he is held a very uh, extensive life at uh, the funeral of Okay, so he's befriended the royal family of Lesotho. His relationship with Jonathan's government was strained. In September 1977, he returned to South Africa to speak at the Eastern Cape funeral of a black conscientious act activist, Stephen Blinko, who, he had, who had been killed by police. At the funeral, Tutu stated that the black consciousnesses was a movement by which God, although Steve sought to awaken in black person a sense of his 
in stemic value and worth as a child of God. So the man's words and dealings in life, he campaigns for LGBT rights, he became an Orba priest prize aureate, friends with Nelson Mandela, friends with the Queen. The long list of people who are just saddened, troubled. Uh, the President Joe Biden and the First Lady said on this morning after Christmas, we are heartbroken to learn of the passing of a true servant of God and the people of and the people, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. His courage and moral clarity helped inspire our commitment to change American policy towards the reprehensive apartheid regime in South Africa. Kamala Harris, Vice President, wrote, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a fervent vocal opponent of apartheid and committed champion of human rights. He inspired millions, not just in South Africa, but worldwide, to stand with those fighting for freedom and justice. The former President of the United States, Barack Obama, said Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a mentor and a friend and a moral compass for me and so many others, a universal spirit. Archbishop Tutu was grounded in the struggle for liberation and justice in his own country but also concerned with injustice everywhere. He never lost his embellished sense of humour and willingness to find humanity in his adversaries. And Michelle and I will miss him dearly. Her Majesty the Queen said, I am joined by the royal family in being deeply saddened by the news of the death of Archbishop Desmond Tutu a man who tirelessly campaigned for human rights in South Africa and across the world. I remember with fondness my meetings with him and his great warmth and humour. Um... Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welby said Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a prophet and priest, prophet and priest, a man who of words and action, one who embroiled the hope and joy that were the foundation of his life. The Dalai Lama said the friendship and spiritual bond between us was some Thing we cherished. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was eternally dedicated to serving his brothers and sisters for the greater common good. Uh, Prince Charles, my wife and I are deeply saddened to hear of the death of the Archbishop of Desmond Tutu, whose bravery in speaking out against the evil apartheid and highlighting the threat of climate change was an inspiration to us all. Uh, we also have from the Pope, I believe. The Pope? Well, as we've done a couple of world. The World Council of Churches, his courageous sense of humour and laughter has helped to resolve many critical situations in South Africa's political and church life. He was able to break amongst any deadlock. He shared with his laughter and grace of God many a time. Uh -huh. um. Ah! His Holiness the Pope Francis was saddened to learn of the death of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Mindful of his service to the Gospel, 
through the proclamation of racial equality, the promotion of racial equality, and the reconciliation of his own native South Africa, his holiness commends his soul to the loving mercy of Almighty God. Probably did more of that than the Catholic Church, but anyway. So, Desmond Tutu, a great man, an outstanding priest, a great follower of Christ, a man who changed the hearts and minds of a country who drew down hate and helped to try and build a nation of love. No matter who you are, what colour you are, where you come from, a true follower of the gospel. And what more can we say when we add the man's life up? A man rooted in his faith of God to try and break down the inadequacies that we as humans have built for one another. Let's all take a leaf out of Archbishop Tutu's life. Let's try and treat the person on the other side with some compassion. Let's remember one thing. Let's treat them how we want to be treated. We all want to be treated fairly. We all want to be treated we all want to be treated equally. Have to remember so does the other person on the other side. It's not always them who are making the decisions. Sometimes stupid decisions are left there. But you can try and fight them. And if you are going to try and fight them, remember you are talking to someone, they are people. They have feelings and thoughts too. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode. And I will see you next tomorrow for the end of the year episode. And then we'll be starting Series 5 on the 1st of January. So, thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. This week's episode has come to an end. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. If you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, head over right now to Twitter and Facebook and like, share and get involved. Join us next time.